All right, welcome to the discussion on queer ecology. If you have not actually read The Shell, then you need to turn this video off and read The Shell, because otherwise I'm just talking to myself. Hi, so I'm going to talk to you today about queer ecology and uh, try to give you some explanation of the argument so that if you want to read this argument, uh, you're prepared to do so or at least have some background as you start to read the cards and get into it. Um, in order to talk to you about queer ecology, I first need to talk to you a little bit about queer theory because queer ecology is a derivative of queer theory uh, and ecological criticisms. So uh, I think you need a little bit of background on queer theory before you can really understand queer ecology. So I think there are two important things that you need to know about queer theory. Uh, the first is that queer theory is a deconstructive agenda uh, in the Derridian sense of unpacking meaning. So words, uh, we tend to think of a word as having a single meaning, right? So if I say ice, you might think of something hard and cold that you would put in your drink, uh, but to be on ice might also mean that you're dead. All right, so words tend to have more than one meaning, and the history of words indicates that what we think we know about words, often we don't know about words, that there's a lot of meanings in them. And so as you start to investigate language, uh, meanings tumble out of words. So you kind of unpack a word like a suitcase, like if you were to cut a word in half uh, and open it up, meanings would come out of it. And sometimes we, you would be find those meanings totally unexpected. Um, the nature of deconstruction means that there is no finality uh, to the world as we know it. That the everything that we know, everything that we understand about the world is a process of becoming. Um, our ontology, our being, our way of being is a process of becoming. It's not a, an end point in and of itself, which means that... Uh, Queer theory re, uh, really resists theology, telos, or endpoint oriented ethics or endpoint oriented understandings of the world. Uh, it embraces things like instability because life is um, unstable is functionally a huge part of the sort of queer theory, queer ecology line of thought. The second thing that I think that you really need to know about queer theory is that queer theory denaturalizes. Which is to say that queer theory does not believe that there is a normal or a natural under which we're all constructed. And queer theory spends a lot of time talking about the things that we take for granted as normal. Things that we just think are, are natural. They're totally unchangeable. So that means scientific elements that we think of as totally unchangeable. Queer theory uh, tries to deconstruct... Right, so to pull apart the meaning of unnatural, even in things like biology, which is why some of the articles that you'll read in Queer Ecology are talking about biology and how we misunderstand biology. Uh, Judith Butler spent some time on the body in order to denaturalize the body because we think of our body as something that was given to us. We just have it. There's nothing we can do about that. Um, it's natural. It's nature. It's what I was born with. And that's not really functionally true, and even if it is functionally true, uh, it might not really be a good principle for us to uh, live our lives around or to create a telos. Maybe it's better to think of our body as a, as not as a natural slate, but as something that we are building, something that we are becoming, something that is constructed um, and was never a blank slate in the first place. So, I mean, you change your body all the time. You add earrings, you add uh, tattoos. Uh, some of you will remove body parts, you know, appendixes will get removed, uh, or, you know, maybe even even in a larger sense, you might have a, you might have a sex change. You might have an operation that literally removes your genitals or adds genitals, right? We've been altering our bodies throughout human history. They're not the natural concept that we think they are, and the meanings of our bodies have altered throughout human history. You know, we in the United States we don't bind our feet. Uh, the Chinese don't bind their feet in a contemporary sense because this is not a way that we consider appropriate to alter our body now. And the same is true of all sorts of body altering techniques uh, that are fraught with meaning. So our body is not really this natural surface upon which uh, other things happen to us that we write things. We undo that natural. This is a big, huge part of queer theory, sort of denaturalizing, because we think of our body as something is natural, um, and everything, uh, everything else is something that is outside of our body. And our body is not a natural, fixed place. Uh, there's not a clear inside and outside of our body. Things permeate our body, right? And uh, our body is intermeshed in the world. 
All right. So life tends to defy the sort of boundaries that are created by naturalization and by essentialism or a telos having a fixed endpoint. Uh, life tends to defy those boundaries. So a good cross-examination question you're reading queer theory or queer ecology is a good cross-ex question. Might, two might be, you have to set them up. First, why should we stop wars, assuming that their impact is wars? Um, and if the meaning, if the reason we should do that is to save lives, then why save lives? And if they don't know the answer to the question, or what, sorry, what is life? That's the second question. What is life? And if they don't know the answer to what is life, then they fundamentally don't have an argument for why we should stop wars because they don't have any reason that life is meaningful or life is valuable. So if it's just like, well, we should stop wars to save lives, but you don't know what life is, functionally what you've said is we should stop wars to do something that I don't understand. So that's our intro to queer theory. All right, so now I want to talk about the queer ecology debate. And I think that, um, you know, important first thing to understand about queer ecology that obviously is comes from queer theory is that queer ecology is uh, the undoing of nature or to be post-nature. What does it mean to... Um, think ecology without nature? I think that's a central question of the queer ecology debate. I want to talk about the Morton cards because the Morton cards are the cards that we're going to use for a bunch of our link debate. Um, and they help explain what affirmatives might do that demonstrates that they are not post nature. So your link arguments are largely about what it means to affirm the natural. And you're proving in a link debate that the affirmative um, is infirming the natural, an essence-oriented natural, a constructed natural, right, as opposed to a deconstructive or denaturalized version of nature. So a good question to ask if it is, if the word is in the affirmative case anywhere uh, is, so I would control F, nature. Uh, what is nature? Uh, there are several good reasons to ask. First is it's a huge part of your link debate if they're like, well, nature uh, is that which is not uh, controlled by or altered by humans, um, you know, or is outside of humanity. Those are all very common nature answers, even in eco-criticism. And it's a great ar link argument to your claim to your larger thesis. But second, I would ask because it tells you if they have thought about your argument and it reveals what might be the two AC answers or start of their answers to queer ecology arguments. They might be really ready to go and you, you want to know that strategically. All right, so I want to talk about the Morton cards in terms of what are the link arguments to queer ecology that come from this evidence. The first, I'm going to talk about four. The first one that I think is the inside-outside link, also known as the affirmative separates humans from nature. All right. Uh, so um, this is the permeability stuff that I was talking about in terms of Judith Butler. She doesn't believe that it is a politically productive way to think about the world, to think of things as being inside and outside, but rather that all life permeates uh, each other and it itself is it's very permeating, meaning that uh, we are enmeshed with each other. So some ways to know that um, they have ideologically separated humans from nature are if they think of human beings as protectors or stewards of the environment. It doesn't matter in what sense because stewardship presumes that we are external to it and that we can save it, we can protect it, we should be protecting it. Um, these things all demonstrate that we do not believe that we are part of it. Also, if they think that... Uh, global warming is anthropogenic or that they think that humans are responsible for acidification or uh, if humans are destroying the environment in any fashion, wind and solar apps might do this a lot. Also, um, you know, any time that they talk about humanity as doing things to the world. So if we're going to drill the world, uh, it is very plausible that we think of ourselves as distinct from the world, right? So those are some things to sort of think about. If they think of nature as this pristine... So, okay, so uh, as I was been saying before, if they think of nature as pristine or wild or pure, and the way that you would know that they do that is if they're really worried that humans have polluted it. If humans have polluted it, then it must have been pure... Um, and wildness before we civilized it or controlled it or polluted it. That's important because uh, the Morton cards talk about the way that eco-criticism, eco-critics, so people who are already on the left who are k things, often separate humans from nature during their K. 
Uh, so that's a really good way to get your link to, no, you think humans are separate from nature. You maintain this inside outside binary that prevents us. The key word is not binary for God's sakes. It's inside outside. You maintain that world perspective, that epistemology, if you will, that knowledge of the world um, in a way that is dangerous. Right? And it's dangerous because it prevents us from having an enmeshed relationship with nature. And we'll talk about the impact of why it's violent in a minute. So the second link argument that I want to talk about is glorifying the human. Oh, glory to the human. Uh, we're humans at the center of the universe. We are the key. Um, so some good ways to know that they have glorified the human. If they love Hedge, they are glorifying the shit out of humans. Humans are awesome because they're obviously very powerful and they stop wars with each other. <laughs> I like that's ever happened. Uh, and they save environments, and they're like, they, we're special because we talk, um, and we have monies that makes us very special. Anyways, uh, anything that makes uh, the humans the center of the universe. So this goes very well with the separating humans from nature, but it's a little bit distinct because it's not just about separating us from nature. It's about separating us and then making us very, very powerful, which is embedded in stewardship, right? We have the power to protect you, nature. Um our Morton cards say that ecology needs to humiliate the human. All right, that in order for us to be in an enmeshed relationship with uh, the the universe, with our world, that we are going to need to humiliate ourselves because we have glorified ourselves to such an extent we got to take us down, so to speak. So to speak. Um, in order to be just a form of difference in the world, in a larger system, uh, we're going to need to take ourselves down a peg. So uh, if they glorify the human, I think that's a pretty good link. The third link argument is uh, ecological sameness. Ecological sameness. I really like this one for drilling sorts of apps and uh, apps that are like, we do dig up all the fossil fuels and use that shit, but we swear it won't pollute. The reason I like that is because that idea presumes a lot of ecological sameness that despite the fact that this coal or oil or natural gas is located in all sorts of places and they're very, very different uh, ecologies, that apparently the drilling or digging up of it will be the same everywhere despite the different ecologies. Um, that is obviously crazy and it presumes a unity of the environment. You know, drilling in the Amazon is not the same thing as drilling in the Arctic. Uh, drilling in Louisiana is not the same thing as drilling in Alaska. All right. Uh, even drilling in different parts of Alaska or even within the same Alaska National Wildlife Refuge, you know, you're going to drill in different places that's going to have different effects, right? Such as this, the caribou that they think are silly arguments. Um, it's, I'm not talking about the caribou, so to speak, in Anwar. What I'm talking about is that the environment that the caribou live in is distinct from the parts of the wildlife refuge where it doesn't, where they don't live in. And so drilling in different parts of the refuge will have different effects. And you should not assume a unity of environment. It assumes that there is an essence, an ecological sameness to our environments and to people. Uh, it, it parallels our ecological sameness of people. It parallels the belief that our body is the backdrop that is normal and natural and there's nothing that we can do about it. And it eliminates the uniqueness of the world. It smooths over the differences of ecologies and acts like they are all the same. The fourth link uh, that I think is a good link is the essence link, or sometimes known as essentialism. Uh, essentialism is when you presume that there is an essence to identity, that there is a thing that is a person. Anyways, uh, what I'm trying to say here is that uh, anything, any affirmative case that assumes an identity of any variety, that it can know that identity, that there is a primary identity, uh, that it can coalition or coalesce around those identities, this is essentialism. It is the essence of a people to presume that natives want something or, you know, that eight in 10 of the Inuit want something. Uh, what is an Inuit is an interesting question, right? These are essentialism questions. But I think in a very broad sense, also the question, what is the U.S. federal government? Because framework often says that it's this policy making entity and we should treat it as such. That is an essentialism claim that there is a single thing that is the U.S. federal government. And the problem with the or how you get from the link debate to your impact debate is that we don't just take this thought and say only in this one instance. We take these thoughts and they become the uh, the foundation of our epistemologies. They become part of the way that we be in the world, right? The way that we think about the world affects the way that we be in the world. So our, epistemo our epistemological formations turn into our ontologies, right? And that, that's just it's just a fundamental thing that human beings do. The way that they think about the world becomes the way that they act in the world.
Uh, so these are the reasons that these link debates then become are, uh, become difficult or become dangerous and uh, spiral into your impact scenario, which will be up next. Impacts. Okay, so now let's talk about the impact to queer ecology. Uh, the primary impact in the uh, shell is eugenics, and I want to talk about that, sort of what that means in the context of this larger critique. So uh, eugenics is obviously a process of um, eliminating the genetic deficiencies in a population, and sometimes a whole population itself, in order to uh, purify your population. That makes a lot of sense with the things that we've talked about in terms of queer theory, right, inside, outside, to get uh, the parts of us that are bad, that are on the inside of our social, outside of the social, to eliminate them, to purify the social. And it also makes sense um, in terms of like ecological sameness for the link debate scenario, right? It's good if you can connect your link arguments to directly to your impact arguments. Uh, because ecological sameness is a way of purifying the environment. It's all the same. It behaves the same way. It smooths on it over any difference that might be difficult to deal with. Also, glorifying the human, right? The human is this great thing, and that's why we don't really feel the need to uh, treat the other parts of our world that we are enmeshed with the same way. Um, so that's the argument, the eugenics card that's in there, but I want to talk about some of the other stuff that's in the other cards the, that are prior to the eugenics card, because they help explain the eugenics impact card, like the violent expelling of the abject. Sorry, you'll find these in those Morton cards. And basically, um, you know, inside, uh, when we discover impurities on the inside, we violently expel it. This is the abject other. And uh, Stavrakakis might call this a scapegoating scenario. We don't have Stavrakakis cards, but I don't know why you couldn't call it a scapegoating scenario. We have to find who is responsible for the impurity and then remove that or prevent those impurities from resurfacing. Um, this is a violent removal of difference, and it helps explain eugenics. Now, why is this eugenics scenario or the violent expelling of difference of the abject, uh, why is that worse than, say, nuclear wars, you might ask? Hey, Tony, that's crazy talk. Clearly nuclear wars are worse. I have three reasons. The first is that it's a precursor to nuclear wars. Uh, we determine who we can nuke and why we would nuke them based on who is the abject other, based on expelling uh, the, uh, you know, expelling the impure, the dangerous to our existence, the threats to our existence. We also don't nuke the inside, we nuke the outside, right? So if there is no inside-outside distinction, who would we nuke? We would have to nuke ourselves. We're obviously not going to nuke ourselves. That's not their scenario. Um, you should ask them what their scenario is, uh, even if it is somebody that nukes us. The the idea is that that sort of ontology is not possible in an enmeshed understanding of nature and of the world uh, because there is no inside outside we're always permeating each other always penetrating each other um, the second reason it's worse is it's systemic all right uh, meaning that it is something that we know that is happening the probability goes our direction we know that we destroy based on an inside outside separation. We know that we destroy based on uh, glorifying humanity and and even some parts within humanity, right? There's gradations of humanity that we consider the real human. Um, don't ever do quoting fingers in a round, but I want you to understand that. Uh, you know, we understand that we destroy in the name of sameness. We have a really long history of doing this. Um, you know, indigenous populations, slavery, queer populations now, Spanish populations. Uh, these are all populations that have been expelled, exterminated, treated as the abject to be spit from the social body, violently eradicated. Um, you know, this is not, this is not news to us. You should make examples. You should make historical examples. And the more detailed or a little bit of detail would be better to those things. But that's a basic understanding. So it's systemic. We know that it happens. It happens with probability. Uh, it happens with the probability that their crazy nuclear war scenario cannot access. Uh, and the third reason is that it is the difference between lives lived and lives never lived. Right? Eugenics is not just about removing the impurities that exist now. It's also about removing the possibility of, imp of impurity in the future. Right? Forced sterilization programs are a good example of eugenics. And as a result, uh, these are lives never lived. 
So nuclear war is about extinguishing lives living. Um, eugenics is about extinguishing lives living, but also lives that will never have the potential to live. So if they can come up with the definition of life and they can come up with the reason it's important, then that's probably a reason that we should give life a chance to live. Next up, alt.